Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 220, I chat with Robert Zone, president of Value Electronics, and Mark Henninger, senior writer at AVS Forum, about the Value Electronics 2014 flat panel shootout. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded August 21st, 2014, episode 220 Value Electronics 2014 Flat Panel Shootout. Help support Twit with your Amazon purchases. Visit twit.tv slash Amazon, click on the Amazon banner, and shop as usual. That's twit.tv slash Amazon, and we thank you for your support. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week, I have two guest geeks on the show. First is Robert Zone, the president of Value Electronics, uh, a retailer in Scarsdale, New York, where the 10th annual flat panel shootout just occurred last weekend. Hey, Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be here. Appreciate you inviting me. You bet. Um, also with us is Mark Henninger, senior writer and social media manager at AVS Forum, uh, my cohort in crime there. Hey, Mark, welcome back. Hi, Scott. Glad to be on the show again. You bet. Uh, Mark was there at the Value Electronics Shootout, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we do, I want to make sure everybody knows that those who are watching live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions uh, about the shootout as we go, and I will pass along as many as I can. So, Robert, this was the 10th anniversary of the Value Electronics Flat Panel Shootout. Uh, tell us a bit of the history. How did it get started? How has it evolved over the years? Well, uh, cinematography and photography and video and audio has been a lifetime passion of mine. And I was a TV broadcast engineer prior to 18 years ago when I opened this company. And I always wanted to find out what the difference is between the higher end TVs is. So I used to buy them all in our retail store and line them up against each other. And I would do a little tweaking myself and just do my own personal evaluation. About 10 years ago, I decided to make it a larger venue and invite the public and webcast it and bring in a professional calibrator to help me better calibrate the televisions and have more test and measurement materials to help us evaluate. It uh, caught on rather quickly, and it grew rather rapidly. About seven years ago, uh, we brought Kevin Miller and Dwayne Davis and Ed Johnson uh, into it, and uh, it escalated rather quickly. About th four years ago, David McKenzie joined us uh, from Europe, and it's become a very, very popular event for evaluating high-end flag flagship televisions each year. Now, these names you're mentioning are the calibrators that you have brought in to make sure that all the TVs that are in the shootout, and we'll talk about what that really means, a shootout, uh, are, are on a level playing field, that they're all calibrated fully to be able to produce the absolute best picture that they are capable of doing. That's correct. And usually people that are videophiles and enthusiasts that buy these televisions have an interest, even if they're doing it themselves and peaking the performance of it. But the main reason is what you said, squeeze every ounce out of them, put them on an equal playing field. So it's an honest evaluation. And uh, that was the main reason for it, to peak their performance and see how they can compete against each other. Mm -hmm. And we do that in high ambient light and also in low ambient light. Which is good because there certainly are people who watch TV in high ambient light with the lights on in the room or during the day. Maybe somebody's doing something else in another room. Of course, you and I and, and Mark are, are all videophiles and interested in dedicated home theater rooms. But sometimes that's not practical or sometimes people want to have TVs in a multipurpose room. And we'd like to know how well they perform under those conditions as well. Very true. Yeah. So how are the TVs selected? How, how, do they, how do they end up being in the shootout? 
Well, they have to be a current model. They have to be in production. They have to be a high-end model. And um, then we bring them in and we evaluate them to see if they can pass the uh, entrance level test, you might say. Mm. If, they, if they perform well in the evaluation, they get put into the event. So it's pretty much each premium manufacturer's uh, flagship model that's evaluated for entry into the event. This year, we actually added in uh, one tier down from uh, Sony and from Samsung uh, because um, – we wanted to have more product in the event, and we had a huge amount of requests for these models. Uh, so we uh, ascend with the times, and we listen to people and what they ask for, so we can hopefully make the event interesting to the broadest audience possible. Well, there, th that brings up a question that uh, we've been covering the event, of course, on AVS Forum quite a bit. Mark, in fact, attended the event, and uh, Mark, you're going to give us your impressions here in a minute. But before that... Um, there have been quite a few comments from people saying, well, you're just showing these flagship super expensive TVs, um, you know, that most of us can't afford. What about uh, the ones we can afford? Well, all the models that are in the event, the event is about the flagship TVs, uh, but all the models that are in the event, you can scale it to what your needs are. First of all, the models started at $3,098. For a Samsung 64-inch, their largest flagship plasma, the F8500, they did go up to a very high number this year, 120,000. When we created the event, we never thought that there would be a TV for 120,000 dollars. Right. That that TV comes in various sizes. It goes down to a 40-inch at 40,000, which is right behind me with that barb cat in the in the scene. So oh, yeah, they, I, they wait, are, wait a minute. That's not, that's not a that's not a 40-inch TV. That's a the 40,000 S9, isn't that a uh, an 85-inch TV? 85-inch TV. Thank you. Yeah. 85-inch uh, yes. TV. So that's where I'm, the I'm line sorry. starts. I'm sorry, Mark. What, what did you just oh, say? No, no, I understand. The the S9 is is an OLED small, and it's an LCD when it's big, which is an odd, uh, odd, an odd Oh, that's bit. true. That's you know, that's, that's kind of – you know, that's very weird. You're exactly right because Samsung happens to use the term S9 – to refer to both their LCD TVs, the, the large UHD TVs, and their smaller OLED or OLED uh, TV, which is an S9C for curved. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but anyway, I see your point about wanting to really look at the flagships or maybe one tier down from the flagship models. Uh, because if you're really trying to see what the, the very best possible uh, – picture quality you can get. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the shootout, right? Correct. Another example is in the 85-inch uh, that we had here, the HU8550, that's available in 65-inch for $2,800. So there's a, you know, you can scale this to what your needs are if you're not looking at a 85-inch screen size. The other is, is that these technologies tend to trickle down. So if we show you what's out today that's very high priced. You can depend on it being at CES uh, with all this high end, great new technology at a lower price. So it's a little <laughs> peek into the future of what we're going to be expecting down the road. One more thing about the model numbers the KN55S9 differentiates it from the S9 that's a UN, UN standing for the uh, beginning of the prefix for all the LCD based panels. Good point. Good point. And the KN is the OLEDs. Where they came up with U and K, I have no idea. But, you know, <laughs> model numbers could be, the, could be the topic for a whole show. <laughs> uh, Mark, you were there and uh, at least one it, – it occurs over two days. Uh, this, time, this year it was Saturday night and also Sunday afternoon. And, uh, Mark, you were there. And uh, tell us your first impressions – just as you walked in the door, uh, what was it like for you to, to walk in that door and see all those TVs? Well, let me start by saying that Robert is crazy for, for even doing this because other <laughs> retailers don't show. They, they don't show calibrated televisions uh, against each other. And uh, just crazy in a good way, I would field. say. Yes, absolutely in a good way. So <laughs> let me preface 
with what happened when I walked in last year. And last year when I walked in, there were three plasmas and a, and a Sony UHD TV. And I was sure, I mean, I honestly was sure that the UHD TV from Sony was going to win. Uh, because in that bright room and just with a still image on it, it, it looked fantastic. By the end of the night, I, I knew the plasmas, you know, had thoroughly trounced it. I honestly walked in this year thinking the same thing, that the LCDs had a chance at winning. Uh, I've just being blown away by the demos at CES and, and later at CE Week in, in New York. I, I just was thinking, you know, these panels have what it takes. Um, by the end of the night, it was, it was a more ambiguous uh, weighing of the pros and cons of different technologies, the size you need, uh, what your actual room lighting is, uh, what kind of content you watch the most. I mean, uh, there, was, there wasn't the same clarity. What, what there definitely was was a much broader array of televisions in terms of sizes. So the first thing I thought was, wow, you know, that's really amazing. From, from 55 inches to 105 inches, you know, that's, that's what the high end now encompasses. Uh, so, yeah, the, the first thing I saw was, was these huge TVs. Uh, that, that, you know, it, it's hard to avoid that, but that's, that's what 2014 yeah. has brought us. So, but yeah. of course, uh, along with that, those huge TVs rely on LCD technology because that's the technology that scales to, to those dimensions. And, uh, you know, so we're only talking about first impressions now. My that's first it. impression was that this is going to be a, a mighty battle and a very interesting <laughs> shootout. Now, uh, Robert, you, uh, this last year you had like one UHD ultra high definition, sometimes called 4K TV. This year you had four, I believe, and they were all in a much larger size than the predominant size from last year. Uh, tell us about the size range that you had with the UHDs and why you chose that. They range from 78 inch, 79 and 85. And then of course the 105 inch, the 21 nine, which is actually 237 to one cinemascope. Right. Uh, we used the largest size primarily because we wanted to show the advantages of UHD from sitting back further. So you didn't have to get right up to it. Uh, we also thought it would be very fun to have that at the event. Where would you see a $120,000, 105 inch cinemascope TV, unless you went to the Consumer Electronics Trade Convention, which is to the trade only. So we right. thought that we would take advantage of this opportunity to show these products to the public. Uh, and uh, UHD needs to be on a large screen to really see and enjoy the beauty of hot, fine resolution. It's a ratio of a screen size to viewing distance. Mm -hmm. And we can get that viewing distance further back if we use a larger screen. Right. But doesn't that also limit the number of TVs that you can sort of put together? I mean, uh, we have a photo, uh, a couple photos of, of a, a wall OTVs, I called it. And hopefully uh, uh, John and Zach can find that one in my um, poor file names. <laughs> uh, there's a wall OTVs, um, which by the way, I want to say Mark Henninger took all these pictures and, and he does a fabulous job taking photos, I have to say. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so here we have the wall OTVs. Uh, using such big ones, uh, we have, I can see a problem. One is that there, there's only so much wall space that you must have in that room. Uh, so that limits the number of TVs you can put up there. Uh, there's a wide angle shot. And, um, you know, so how do you how do you deal with that? I mean, there's then there's also the issue. These are all LCD TVs, these ultra high def ones. So that depending on where you're sitting, you might be very well off axis from one while you're right on axis for another. And as we all know, LCD TVs have off axis problems. Oh, that's correct. And the off-access problem is less of an issue on a larger screen. The larger the screen, the lower physics works in its favor. But more mm. importantly, every year, even when it's plasmas only, we always make the audience or ask the audience to walk around as we're explaining each attribute with test patterns and content, particularly with test patterns, to get real close to each panel with their voting palette, dead center to each one, and determine your opinion uh, from the test patterns on each individual TV. We 
judge them in a group after all the ballots are in. But the ballots are determined and voted independently to each television. And we're going to talk about the ballots in a minute. I have that on my list of things to talk about. Before we do, though, um, uh, let's see. You had, I believe, eight TVs officially in the shootout, right, that were, that were competing against each other. And people come in and they, and they judge them on various criteria, which, we, as I say, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, there were four, some Samsungs, a couple of Sonys, a uh, couple of LGs, at least one LG, uh, why were there some manufacturers not involved? There's two reasons why some may not have been here. The majority of the reason was that the products weren't available. So we have a lot of mid-year introduction products. Also, as I mentioned earlier, there is the evaluation test that has to get passed as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned some products aren't even available yet, and that's true. For example, uh, many people are waiting with great anticipation for the Toshiba L9400, I believe, and also the Vizio P-Series and Reference Series. Uh, I'm wondering if it might not be uh, worthwhile to think about putting this event a little later in the year to give more of those TVs a chance to come out. Because as we all know, they introduce them at CES, and then they yeah. come out anytime between the spring and the fall or even December. Yeah. Well, in the 10 years of our event, they have ranged from very, very early May, which was last year, actually, till mid-October. And we do that based on exactly what you said. However, maybe things slip, but we plan this event fairly far in advance. And sure. we ask each manufacturer, what do you think you're going to be ready with mass production units that we can buy in bulk and then select randomly from our inventory? Mm -hmm. And we had been promised uh, commitments from these manufacturers uh, for that production would be available. It's not uncommon for it to slip by a week or two, which is what happened. And it's mm. difficult to reschedule when you have people like Joe Kane and Dr. Larry Weber attending, and of course, Mark attending, uh, and our panel of experts attending. It's difficult to reschedule as we get closer to the event date. So I wasn't able to adjust the date any further. Yeah, that's and that's, I'm sorry we missed those. I'm I am too. We're buying them, of course. So we're putting them up on the wall, and we'll continue. The wall stays up for the whole year, and we yeah. integrate mid-year introduction TVs into it. And that's without even getting into the LG UHD TVs, which I think are the most anticipated televisions. Uh, the, you mean the uh, UHD OLEDs? You mean OLEDs. yeah, the o right. yes, the OLEDs from exactly. From LG, yeah. Right, which we're expecting the 65-inch uh, sometime in the next month, I think, and then the 77-inch sometime after that. Um, Robert, you mentioned uh, Joe Kane and Larry Weber, and I wanted Mark to comment uh, on their presentations because part of this uh, event, more than beyond uh, simply evaluating these TVs and looking at them and seeing which one performs the best in different categories, uh, there have been in the past, and this year was no different, uh, presentations by some really heavyweights, uh, industry experts. Joe Kane, who's the video guru of all video gurus, who's been on this show a number of times, uh, gave a presentation. And Larry Weber, Dr. Larry Weber, is often credited as being the father of plasma TV. Uh, so, Mark, I know that you saw Joe's presentation. What did you think of that? And we have a picture of him actually saying something here. Uh, Joe most certainly laid uh, out a lot of the issues that uh, need to be overcome if uh, UHD is going to be a fully realized uh, format and that uh, his main focus was that uh, the, the, the interconnection between devices needs to be uh, needs a lot more attention than, than it's getting with HDMI 2. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he advocated for uh, greater bit depths, and uh, I can say that every time I have seen the man speak, I have felt inspired and agree with him and hope that his advocacy uh, is reaching the right ears and is mm. acted upon. There's Joe. That's, There's Joe. Here, here he is telling you that if you're in Vegas, you know that red is much deeper and much richer than any red you see on a TV. Right. And interesting, I don't know if, if you remember exactly which TVs those were, but uh, just in that picture alone, and I'm sorry for those of you who can't see it, because the the color of red is very different between those two. One In one case, the one he's pointing to, it's really red. 
In the other case, it's distinctly orange. Was was that your experience? Did you actually is that is this photo uh, uh, that's, accurately that's, reflecting what's going on? I need to discuss all of this for just one minute. On the right, you have the Sony XBR 85 X950 B. To its left, you have the Samsung UN 85 HU 8550. Uh, the camera is basically facing directly towards the Samsung, so it's getting the full resolution. I mean, the not the resolution, the full uh, color and the full contrast. The the Sony is kind of off to the right. Uh, and, and you're actually looking at off angle from the camera. So what you're seeing is the loss in uh, saturation caused by off angle viewing. I mean, that's a $25,000 Sony there, but yeah, you're 30 <laughs> degrees off and it, and it loses that. Uh, it's also possible that um, I mean, I, that, that, that's pretty much what happened with all the LCDs. And it's because they're using vertically aligned panels so that that head-on contrast really is uh, extraordinary. There's only one IPS panel uh, in that show, and it did perform the worst among all the TVs. Uh, mm. So, you know, there, there is something to be said for that head-on view. Uh, I, I guess what I wanted to discuss there is, is, is that in the show, you really had to use your memory to, to, to compare one television to another because you can't stand in front of one television and then glance over to the one to the right or the left uh, because uh, it, it's not a fair comparison at all. Uh, the best you can hope for is to stand between the two televisions and, and glance left and right. Uh, it's, it's but even that's not on, that, then that's not on axis for any of them. Right, neither of them would be are, are looking their optimum. So uh, th there is a way around that. If you're one individual reviewer, you can aim all the televisions directly towards your seat and then rotate, and then you can look at them all face on. But just because of the practical realities of having an audience and, and the way the shootout is, is, is orchestrated, they all have to face straight out. And therefore, as Robert noted, to, to really evaluate them, you have to look at them head on. So what you're seeing here is one ca the camera looking head on at the one picture and then capturing the other one from an angle. Mm -hmm. And the additional loss of, of uh, saturation that results in. And, and, and many of the pictures I took are off angle and, and you can see the... The, the various colors and, and, and degrees of loss of, of black levels that occur with the LCDs when, when you do that. Yeah. Uh, Robert, it, there's probably no way around it if you have an audience. Speaking of which, let me ask you real quick, how many people did attend this event this year? Uh, over the two days, 137. Mm. And so obviously they can't all be looking at all the LCDs on axis at the same time. That's Im impossible. That's correct. And that's why the walking around and facing each TV is critical. And I agree with Mark. There's no real great answer. You do have to have a little bit of memory from where you just left off. It's not as critical or hard to do when there's test patterns up there. A little bit more detail, a little more difficult with content, video content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so... Let's talk a little bit about, about the calibration. I know you guys, I mean... Uh, we don't have a calibrator here, unfortunately. Uh, Kevin Miller was going to be here, and he got a gig at the last minute, getting ready for Cedia, which is less than three weeks away. Holy smokes. Um, uh, but I do have a couple of uh, photos of the calibrators, and I just want to make sure everybody sees those, and, and some of the calibration patterns that were used to e evaluate. Here's one, for, here's one pattern, for example. Um, showing how they're set how they're setting color and tint uh, mark tell us a little bit about this picture well some of the televisions have a, a blue only mode and uh what you can do with that is uh compare the 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 the, the luminosity of the individual colors uh as as reproduced when it's only blue and and what you should see is is basically a, a continuous field of blue with those black squares uh, in the middle instead of uh, varying like uh, shades of of that blue of blue uh, yeah saw, right yeah if you saw varying shades then then either your saturation or your your hue are off and in modern televisions it would almost certainly just be the the saturation because the hue control. Is like, usually correct, right? Right. Um, uh, and those but, but those middle two those middle two TVs don't have either. They don't have their blue only mode on, or they probably don't, so that you can see what the full color image looks like. That when you turn the blue only mode on, it should look like that. Like look, look like those blue ones. 
I suspect they were just uh, turning it on for each one, but uh, not every television has that capability. Right. And when they don't, of course, then you have to use those blue filters that come with the setup discs like the Spears and Munsell or the Joe Kane disc. Um, right. They come with these blue filters that you put over your eyes and you can sort of do the same thing. The problem is that those filters don't work the same from one TV to another. So it's much nicer to have uh, the blue only mode if if the TV has it. That's that's to me a pretty big selling point for setting it up to look its to look its best, which is what we want to do here. Um, Robert, tell us a little bit about content distribution. Uh, you were, I assume, you were pl playing the same content on all these TVs. Uh, how is yeah. that set up? Uh, that was one of the most difficult. Uh obstacles this year because uh, UHD has now moved to HDMI 2.0 with 60 frames per second and there is no switching equipment and I can tell you that I drove all of those equipment manufacturers crazy by <laughs> haunting them to please give me an engineering sample or some way that I can pass purely a UHD at 60. We finally settled on key digital with a uh, 8 by 8 matrix switch so we have the eight outputs fed with eight inputs of UHD 2160p at 24 or 30 frames per second. So we were mm. a little bit limited there. But we also had Samsung and Sony's uh, handmade uh, UHD at 60 frames per second. Each one had four to five outputs. So we were able to show content out of those two devices in UHD at 60 frames per second. The other thing is when we were showing UHD content, the 1080p displays went blank. Right, because of course they can't. They don't right. know what to do with the uh, with UHD content coming in. Um, now I'm I'm a little surprised. Were you able to the Sony server, which I think is what you're talking about here, which provided the UHD content, uh, as far as I know, only works with Sony TVs, and the same with the Samsung. Uh, That's right. Is that, um, is that so, well? Yes, that is true. But both companies provided special samples for us, and they ah. had. So Sony made a uh, four-output HDMI 2.0 chipset uh, with beautiful 4K 60 frame per second content. Mm. And Samsung made the same thing with five outputs for us. This is not uh, a, a normal product. We tested them. There was no clipping or anything. They worked perfectly. Uh, so we had those two devices. And they worked on any brand TV. Oh, wow. <laughs> we did Boy, have I wish some... We did have some problem passing PC level. Uh, Joe Kane had some beautiful 4K content that we had some trouble because PC levels coming out of the PC seemed to be lower. So we were losing our sync every once in a while, which was a little bit frustrating uh, at times. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, so I imagine and we Joe had, was we particularly had, frustrated. Yeah, we had all the televisions showing beautiful 1080p at all so you can see all the TVs with 1080p of course on the UHDs there they can only display it at UHD so they would up convert those they would up convert signals. right yeah and we'll talk we'll talk about that in a minute as well yeah. uh, m5 in the chat room says in all the pictures i saw from even the far left tv image looks out of proportion everything looks wider any reason for that mark i, I would assume maybe because you were using a somewhat wide angle setting on your lens to get that much information in the picture yes uh it, they'll look stretched out uh, just like the tv behind me uh mm. when you shoot at an <laughs> angle uh you'd have to shoot straight on to, to to get the proportions to look normal right right another test pattern i was really interested in was the red test pattern and i know we have a picture of that as well uh if uh there it is uh and again we're actually that shows a lot tell us tell us what we're looking at here mark well uh, from the bottom, we're looking at uh, the Samsung uh, OLED on the left and the LG OLED on the right. In the middle, we're looking at uh, the Samsung something or other 9000 uh, UHD HU 9000. Right. And then uh, next to that, we're looking at uh, the less expensive Sony in the show, the XBR 79 X900B. And on top, we're looking at the Samsung uh, F8500 Plasma. So... What, what you really see here are, is that the, L, that the LCDs have uniformity issues that, that, that just, you know, you, you can't avoid it. Um, and you also see uh, with the F8500 that uh, it has a, a vertical viewing angle issue that causes it to, to darken near the top. And uh, 
it, it just happened to be that because it was that high, if you're really up close in, in that audience, it would, it would dim like that. So you're seeing the various effects uh, of, of, uh, of viewing angle issues on, on the three top TVs. And on the bottom, you're seeing the fact that OLED, uh, at least as far as uh, screen uniformity and uh, as far as the viewing angle uh, goes, you know, they, they both actually look pretty good. Uh, there were some viewing angle issues with the, with the OLEDs, so I, I wanted to address that. And, and specifically on the left with that Samsung, you see that it, it doesn't look the same as the, the others in terms of how it's rendering that, uh, that red. Um, the, and, Samsung, uh, the Samsung's on the lower left, right? On the lower left, right. And that, and, that and was a recurring it looks very theme. bright. It looks the, like the sort of brightest, reddest. It's a little right. bit orangey, well, perhaps. Yeah, it's, it's orangey, and, and that's the odd thing. From, an off, from a significant off angle, I don't want to be like from a slight off angle. From a significant off angle, everything kind of became orangey with that that Samsung, and it has something to do with how the RGB OLED uh, uh, is, is arrayed as opposed to the way the LG has white OLEDs uh, in there. I mean, I don't know the technical details, but there's an off angle thing and it makes everything become orangey, including red. Uh, as, as you can see here, I, uh, I actually took this as a very uh, dark exposure so that it wasn't clipping the reds so that you could actually see you know, what's really going on. So, yeah, like I said, what this picture shows you is a limited vertical viewing angle on the F8500. It shows you screen uniformity issues with the two LCDs. It shows you a, a uh, hue-related uh, viewing angle issue with that Samsung, and it pretty much shows you why that LG won. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've you've spilled the beans here. Everybody on NAVS already knows who won. I was kind of waiting for the end of the show for that, but that's all right. That's no problem. <laughs> that's all right. It's all right. Um, <clears throat> because the winner actually, the, the 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 declared winner actually turns out to be a, a bit of an interesting story in and of itself, which we'll get to. Uh, but Robert, I wanted to ask you first, and somebody in the chat room also made this comment or asked this question, and I can't find it right at the moment, is that the F8500 plasma, the only plasma in this year's shootout, uh, was very high up on the wall. Now, the reason, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think the reason that one of the reasons that it was there in the first place is that it won last year, right? That's, that is correct, and it is a carryover product for the first half of this year through the end right. of the calendar year. And uh, listen, I have to admit it. It was, it was a disadvantage because it was up so high. Uh, it still did remarkably well because Plasma will do that, especially one as good as that one. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was disadvantaged, and I apologize for that. Uh, in spite of that, it, um, it shares the winning crown. Yeah, so, indeed. Uh, but it, but, and, and I guess you probably had to put it up that high because there wasn't any place else to put it. Maybe I, I don't know. Well, that's the reason. Yes, yep. and uh, we we hope to move this to a larger venue for 2015 so that we can uh, have more product in there and have them all equally spaced and equally positioned in one eye level. Mm -hmm. One thing. Uh, oh, and uh, before we get off to that. Um, and of course, the F8500 plasma has this anti-reflective filter on it, which is sometimes called a louver filter, which, which causes exactly what, what that picture shows and what Mark was talking about, which is that as you go off axis vertically above or below the screen, uh, the brightness, the amount of light that reaches your eye drops off quite a bit. So uh, that was another unfortunate thing that that happened about that plasma and yet holy smokes it you know it still came out really well as as we will talk about now <clears throat> uh we have much more to talk about here but before we do i want to take a moment and thank everyone uh who is watching this show or listening to this show because you're obviously fans of twit and many of you i'm sure shop on amazon i mean who doesn't i do uh, most people do, and for good reason. It's it's a great way to uh, to find what you need, and now there's a way to support Twit while you're shopping at Amazon. I mean, what could be better than that? You already know that the price, selection, and convenience of Amazon.com, and as I said, you can now help support Twit with your Amazon purchases. It's so easy. 
You just go to twit.tv slash Amazon and click on the Amazon banner there at the uh, right of the screen and boom, you're in Amazon. Costs you nothing extra and anything you purchase there will certainly help keep the lights on at the Brick House, which we certainly would love to keep happening. Now, when you go to that twit.tv slash Amazon page, you'll see a number of products that are featured, one of which I want to bring to your attention, uh, which just appeared there recently. It's a book by Andy Weir called The Martian. Uh, it's a novel. I haven't read it yet, but it is certainly what one thing I'm going to purchase immediately because the story sounds very intriguing. It's about an astronaut, one of the first to land on Mars, and he gets into all kinds of trouble and that's uh, and tries to has to survive somehow. One of my favorite kinds of stories, uh, sort of based in reality, near future. It's going to be it's a great story. And Andy Weir, the author, was on Triangulation a couple of weeks ago talking about this book and and other stuff. I'm sure. So I do want to recommend. Uh, that book. I haven't read it yet myself, but I have no doubt, none whatsoever, that it's going to be a fascinating read, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, the other thing, you, one of the other things you can do is go to Amazon Prime, and if you're an Amazon Prime member, uh, you can, they have tons, tons of movies to watch. Uh, some of the more recent ones that have been uh, added to Amazon Prime, one of my favorites is Amadeus. Now, that's not a new movie, of course. It's been out for quite a while, but it is certainly one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, F. Murray Abraham is fantastic. Uh, Tom Hulse is amazing as, uh, as Mozart. And, uh, in fact, I knew the guy who was the uh, music um, director of that show, of that movie, and uh, he did a fabulous job, a fabulous job. So I do want to recommend that. That's just recently come into Amazon Prime, as has Robin Hood, Men in Tights, uh, the Mel Brooks take on the Robin Hood story, which is so funny. And I have to tell you that I actually spent two days on the set of that movie uh, in, in a Renaissance band that was in the fair when Robin came to do his archery contest. And I went to the theater thinking, oh, boy, I get to see myself on screen. I was on the cutting room floor. Not a moment of it was I on, but it was still fun. You know, I got to see the, how the movies are made. It was, it was really pretty cool. So that's just two of many, many movies that have just been added, much less all the ones that are there already. Uh, so, and, and it's all perfect. It's all very available to you simply by going to Amazon. And we sure do appreciate it. If you go there uh, via twit.tv slash Amazon, that banner on the right hand side is uh, where you, uh, Click to get in. You can even go there from the UK and Canada. Uh, so it's not only limited to those in the US. Um, and again, whatever you buy, please make sure to click through the Amazon banner at twit.tv slash Amazon. It's an easy way to support Twit. You can also bookmark that page. I certainly have. And click through our link every time you shop there. And there are even, click, as I say, links for Amazon UK and Canada. Once again, that's twit.tv slash Amazon, and we thank you so much for your support. Okay, um, here's a question for you. We've been talking about UHD. UHD TVs are here, obviously. They made a big, big appearance at the uh, shootout. Um, Robert, I was wondering, have you ever considered dividing the competition into divisions, you know, the UHD division and the 1080p division or HD division uh, and declaring a winner in each of them and then having a best in show over and above that. We have considered that and I think that still is a good idea. Uh, but I have a lot of advisors in this and most <laughs> advisors told me, let them all be in the shootout together and may the best one win. And I, I guess we, at the end, we decided to go with that. Uh, but uh, that's, I think that is a good idea. Mm. You know, it's like a dog show, right? You got, you got your, yeah. your, your best German shepherd, your best poodle, whatever, and then there's best in show. Um, it, because as you said before, you had a UHD, you had some special UHD servers that were showing UHD content on the UHD sets, but the 1080p sets could not show them. Uh, so, uh, yes, Mark. That, that, no, that that came up uh, on, on the forums 
many members expressed uh, the desire to see real like cinematic content playing the same content playing in 1080p and uh, and native uh, UHD at the same time. They thought that that was what was missing from the shootout that would have potentially pushed, uh, you know, votes for the UHD TVs uh, up a bit higher, maybe for the just the the, the overall image quality category. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that that a lot of people really wanted to see that that direct comparison of native 1080p versus native 2160p uh, of the same actual cinematic content playing concurrently. I'm not sure if Boy, that's that, doable. I don't. I don't know if that's doable. As you say, exactly so. I think that would be very, very hard to do because you would need separate servers um, and they would have to be synchronized somehow. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you had servers that were capable of reading time code, uh, <laughs> you could do it, but that sounds like a very expensive proposition. Uh, and otherwise, how would you do that? That uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, Robert, that's maybe something to think about for next year. If there, if, I don't even know if there's a possible way to do it, but if there were, it would be very interesting, don't you think? Absolutely. I like that idea as well. And I just wanted to comment that I read a review where, or maybe David told me this, David Katzmeyer told me he does that. And he, he'll he play the Blu-ray disc, and then he'll take the HD pack from Samsung with the same movie in UHD, Master in UHD, and mm -hmm. uh, try to get the time sync as best as he can by speeding up one or the other. And he tells me he does that, and I know he does, and it's a very brilliant idea. We tried it. We couldn't coordinate it amongst the eight TVs uh, to work uh, properly. So mm -hmm. Uh, we we didn't do it this year, but Mark, I think that's a great idea, and I think we're going to promote you from attendee to uh, advisor. <laughs> All right, nice. you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> I love it. I love that's it. Pretty cool. Thanks, uh, Robert. You're about to say something. Well, I was going to mention, I hate to go backwards, but on that louver filter, I just wanted to tell you that the louver oh, yes. filter is designed to be much more aggressive on overhead lighting than it is on light that comes from below. For good reason, because it's usually overhead lighting that disturbs it. So the louver filter from down below is not as aggressive. Also, it was really bad in the front row. As you moved back to the second and third row, the louver filter wasn't there. So it only affected those in the front row. And of course... Mark gets a front row seats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, what I saw was that if you stood up, uh, it, right. it, it, it got brighter. It was when you were sitting and in the front row, at least on the first night. I don't know if you tilted it down on the second night, that that was, uh, yeah, you know, that, and, and I was really just pointing out that you could see that happening in the photo. Um, Absolutely. You know, right, right. Um, and, and that was a question in the chat room was, you know, why not tilt it downward? And I, I guess you did it on the second night, right? It, it was actually tilted down the first night, but not enough. We didn't realize how far forward all the seats had to go uh, until we put out these 100 plus seats. So we didn't know that we were going to be that close to the uh, device and we didn't tilt it enough. It was a very gradual tilt. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, next up, I want to talk about the evaluation process. Basically, these... All these people come in, and I guess we should start by saying that most of the members of the audience, the people who come in and participate, uh, we, we'd want to probably call them video enthusiasts or video files, right? I mean, they're not just Joe Blows off the street, right? 100% absolutely true. <laughs> many, 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 many came from the forums, AVS forum and all the other forums. Uh, yeah. Many, many were professional cinematographers, directors, uh, evaluate, TV evaluators came as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So the audience was a very high end audience. This is not the general public here. Right, right. And so they come in, they're confronted with these eight TVs. Uh, I believe you give them some pieces of paper, some forms to fill out, right? Well, in advance of it, we do have an application form that's very brief, but the form that they get when they come in, when they register, is actually the voting ballot. Mm. And we and have we a picture of... Give them, we also give them the contrast ratios and all the measurements that we took. And I have that ah. here. If you want me to hold it in front of the camera, I could do that. Well, actually, so I, have they, a picture of, I have a picture of Mark's ballot. Oh, that's that great. He, <laughs> that he filled out. There it is right there. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you can see each of the TVs. And across the top, you can see the six uh, picture quality characteristics or parameters, uh, attributes, if you want, uh, that are being voted upon, which are black level, 
uh, I can't read them a hundred percent well there, Mark. Why don't you go through them with me? Oh, I, I'm sorry. My actual numbers. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. The categories. Uh, black, black level contrast ratio, color accuracy, yep. motion yep. resolution, uh, and and just general sharpness uh, during actual content. Day mode, uh, which is w looking at the material uh, in the store with the lights on. And uh, general content video quality, your 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 actual impression of, of how things look. Right. So that's that's your impression of th this TV looks great or mediocre or not mm -hmm. so great or whatever. It's a it's the overall catch all sort of category, I guess. Right. Yes. And uh, a lot of people asked me, uh, like, why I had the numbers that I had, for example, for color accuracy. And the answer is that I graded that particular category not just looking at it straight on. I took points off of the OLEDs. I just want to note this uh, for the uh, off-angle viewing issues that I saw. Mm. Even on the OLEDs? Yeah, on the OLEDs, specifically but on the OLEDs. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, you it was, expect that on you expect that on LCD, but I didn't expect that on OLED. Yes. Which is which is just so weird. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, Robert, the the um, voting is on a scale of one to ten, I believe, right? That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so everybody gets this sheet, and they mark down their their numbers uh, for each TV. And can people vote if they've only been to one day, at not both days? Usually people are here only one day. I gotcha. I gotcha. Okay. So how many votes did you get total then? How many people actually voted? You, see, you said you had 130 some people actually attend. That's over the two days, but not everybody's permitted to vote because they might be the manufacturer. So we, ah, don't, permit, of course. we don't permit them to vote. Uh, I don't have that exact number in front of me, but I know it's about 80. Okay. So roughly 80. We'll call it roughly 80. That's fine. And so everybody votes. They walk around, they look at the TVs, hopefully straight on the money as well as off axis maybe and evaluate these six different criteria. And they hand in their ballots and then you take them and what do you do with them? We tabulate them and we see uh, how many uh, categories each panel won in. So we tabulate how many categories they've won in and uh, we... Um, we, we like contrast ratio best of all. We like black level contrast ratio particularly because that's mm -hmm. the combination of peak luminance as well as black. And we, uh, we, we look at the total number as well, the full number of, uh, of, of uh, votes for each product. Uh, but it's heavily weighted, I would say, towards how many categories they win. Okay, but, but each of the categories is weighted as well, correct? Well, they're all one point with the exception of contrast ratio, and we look at that as two points because we look at, as most reviewers do, and as ISF even set out standards, contrast ratio being most important attribute. So that gets two for every one. And then instead of the seven categories, we act, six categories, we divide the number by seven. And that's how we come up with uh, the uh, overwhelming decisions that we make. But there's other decisions. How many categories did they win in? What's the total if you counted it without weighting it? Uh, so there's a few different parameters and ways that we judge, which is what made it difficult last year and this year to come up with a winner. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of so ways to statistically look at the data. Exactly. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But first, there's a a couple of people in the chat room who are wa wondering about quote unquote blind testing, uh, which obviously you can't do without <laughs> without seeing the screens. But is there any way to obscure the maker of each set? I mean, when you're in there what, looking at these TVs, you know what's a Sony and you know what's a Samsung and so on. Uh, I don't see any way to to get around that other than to actually build a wall in which the bezel and the logo and all that stuff is is invisible. Yeah. Well, that the wouldn't menus. even conceal it because as soon as the menu comes up, thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. As soon as the menu comes up, you know which brand it is. Yeah. Um, so that wouldn't even really help. We ask people to be very honest and very mature about this. Leave their personal agendas home. Uh, just look at picture quality. We don't care about 3D. We don't care about smart features. We don't care about your past experience, good or bad, or your partialness. Just l judge this on picture quality. And please leave everything else out of this room. And I think people are genuine 
genuine and honest uh, about that, but I can't control the people really. <laughs> Mark, I, what did I you mean, have to say about that? Well, you'd easily be able to figure it out in this show because you'd know that the OLEDs were 55 inches and curved, and you would know that the larger curved uh, UHD was was a Samsung. You know, if you just generally knew the list of TVs in the competition, you'd certainly know which one the 105 inch one was. So right. it just seems like you'd. Trying to hide them wouldn't wouldn't help. Uh, a it lot just of them doesn't work. Easily identified. It doesn't mm -hmm. work at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and right. I, and I don't think that's a, a really big deal because what you really saw at that competition is that it was difficult to declare a winner because the emissive displays all scored incredibly close to each other, and then all the transmissive displays, the LCDs, also clo scored incredibly close to each other. Uh, yeah. the, the gap was between those two fundamental, you know, ways of, of getting the image out of the screen. Mm -hmm. And we should make sure that everybody understands that emissive displays are those which in which the pixels emit their own light, which is OLED and plasma. And transmissive displays are those which transmit light through a layer, which means LCD. So there you there you have those two particular things. So uh, and LE guy says, yeah, right, no agenda. We're human beings. We can't avoid, we can't be completely objective. It's not, uh, it's not possible. But I think, Robert, your, your point is very good to just say, look, do the best you can. <laughs> I mean, what else can you do? Yeah. You know, there's uh, several issues with the LCD based panels. Uh, they can't close the doors all the way. So they have light leakage coming through uh, an emissive pixel. Each individual pixel is its own local dimming zone at many different luminance levels. It's so much more accurate of a picture, much more photographic looking. Right. Exactly. Oh, and that brings up uh, dimming zones. And I wanted to talk about that briefly. Um, mm -hmm. Of the LCDs, as you say, the emissive displays, they have each individual pixel is dimmable. So, you know, they have 2 million, 2.2 million dimmable zones in the case of a plasma 1080p set. Um, the LCDs, uh, there are two types of illumination. One is where the LCDs are in an array behind the LCD panel. And the other is which the, in, in which the LCDs are, uh, LEDs rather, sorry, are in are along the edges are mounted along the edges of the screen and some very uh, sophisticated um, optical panels are used to bring that light out in and through the LCD panel. Uh, of the four LCDs that were there, which were all UHD, uh, there were at least a couple that were full array local dimming or FALD, and there were a couple that were edge lit, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's correct if you're asking me. I call it direct yeah. lit, but full array local dim is a more common way of calling it. Yeah. And there were two full array local dimmed or direct lit ones, and there were three that were edge lit actually. Mm. Um, okay, and one question that came up before the show started was, how can you tell how many zones there are? For these falled or direct lit sets, the LEDs behind the screen are organized into a series of zones, relatively large compared to the size of the LEDs themselves, and certainly really large compared to the size of the individual pixels. Uh, and a lot of manufacturers who make these direct lit or falled sets will not tell you how many zones, local dimmable zones, they have. Vizio is a notable exception. The M series has 32. The E series has 12 or 16, which is very low. It should be higher than that. Uh, Mark, didn't you say that somebody at this event uh, uh, explained how you can tell how many zones there are? I, I'm going to have to pass that one to Robert because... <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, may, think, may I made I a think mistake. Those, I mean, I could, I could describe it, but Robert knows exactly what those guys did because I think they figured this one out. Okay, Robert, what do, what do you say? Well, actually, uh, a gentleman, uh, another enthusiast who's very popular in the forums, Dr. David Shank and myself, uh, and mostly Dr. Shank, developed a, a method 
of counting the zones. It's proprietary to us, but it's a very simple one. So I guess this is no big deal if we get copied here. And I think we're the <laughs> only ones who, who have ever counted the actual amount of local dimming zones. And what it is basically, and you can do it at home yourself with a computer and a mouse, uh, make the screen zero luminance, make it black, get the computer hooked up to it with a white mouse pointer on it, uh, turn the contrast and brightness up, and run that mouse pointer on the left-hand edge of the screen slowly. And you can see it going from one zone to another. You can see the zones lighting up. You wow. see how large you see how large they are, and you count them, and then run across the top of the screen. Uh, so uh, David McKenzie actually furthered that design that Dr. Shank and I developed to automate it on a PC. And he has this beautiful little white box that goes up and down and counts the zones automatically. Wow. And we, de we demonstrated that. So we actually count the local dimming zones, and it's a very effective and accurate way of doing it. The manufacturers uh, uh, didn't want to admit it and uh, didn't <laughs> want us to release it probably, uh, but uh, some of them were, were quite good. The uh, X950B had a good amount of zones. Obviously, the S9 had a lot of zones. And, and some of the edge-lit ones uh, were able to produce more local dimming zones, even though they're edge-lit. They, uh, they do mm. have local dimming as – Hard as it is to explain that with their magical way of doing it. You know, I always, when, I, when the edge lit set, I always put the words local dimming in quotes because I, know. I, can't, <laughs> I can't believe that it's really that good. But this is a fabulous test. I had never thought of that before. I really must try it. That's great. Thank you. Works great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, M5 in the chat room is asking, has anyone, uh, does anyone keep stats on uh, the viewing position, the seating position, the different angles for, for TVs? Uh, of the ones voting versus the scores. He's wondering if there's a pattern there. And Robert, you said that you encourage people to get up and walk around and look at all the TVs on axis. Uh, so I don't think you keep track of, you know, which score came from which angle, so to speak. Uh, we haven't. That's not a bad idea either, though. And uh, mm. But I think we try to overcome it the best we can by having them parade around. We try to do it in an organized, single-file way to move them through. We give them a time limit. Uh, when they have only a few minutes left, the presenter raises his hand and says, you have two more minutes to do your voting. Uh, so we try to uh, make some sense of it. And, and Mark, we did that so much better the second night than we did the first night. So I'm sorry <laughs> that you didn't come back the second night. Boy, you know what? You learn stuff all, each time, I'm sure, Robert. You, you learn stuff each night and then each event so that next year it, you can continually do quality improvement, which I'm sure is uh, one of your goals. Absolutely. So true. Thanks for saying that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Well, uh, it's time now to talk about the winners. And we've already mentioned them and alluded to them, but let's come straight out and say uh, this was the first year, Robert, that you actually declared a tie, <laughs> which I find very, very interesting. Who, who were the two winners? It's LG's brand new OLED, and we had a mass-produced uh, example of that here. Uh, it was beautiful. It's the 55 EC9300. Had some nice improvements from the first generation that's only eight months old. So they had some <laughs> nice upgrades in that. And then the uh, winner to share the crown with them, and again, like you said, in 10 years, we never did this before, was the winner of last year, the Plasma F8500. And interestingly, even though it was disadvantaged as being so high, and some people have commented that some firmware that helped fix uh, some luminance uh, pops, so to speak, actually may have lowered the uh, brightness and maybe even MLL. It still scored so very well. So it was very tough between those three uh, the other displays. Uh, right, exactly. And I wanted to point out that the popular vote uh, by the audience uh, th basically came up with a tie. And, and I want to talk about how those that those votes can be looked at one way or, or another to see which one actually came in front. But then the calibrators, uh, Kevin, David, and Dwayne, uh, vote for their favorite display among all of the TVs there. And they unanimously chose the Samsung OLED. I found that very interesting. That's correct. They did. And they had uh, reasons of uh, better uniformity in some issues and uh, possibly even some better color, as well as flatter gamma. 
And that's these attributes are important to these guys, and and they were not alone in selecting that one as the best. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't think I should share with you some of the other top, top, top professional reviewers that were in the room that actually also had agreed with them. Now, mm. by the numbers, they didn't win, uh, but uh, it was so close, and they're so they're so much more similar than they are different. And one's a total dedicated RGB uh, OLED lamps, and the other one is a bigger white all OLED with filtering, so to speak, that might come in front of them to make the subpixels of RGB. So Dr. Weber had a fantastic presentation that was technical, but yet super easy to understand how these two different OLED technologies perform and how they operate. It was very, very informative. Um, I'm really sorry I missed that. I'm hoping to get uh, Dr. Weber on this show to talk about uh, his illustrious career with Plasma and now the new... The new um display technologies because uh, he's a, a very, very smart guy and an interesting guy as well. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, Sound Pro 69 says, popular vote. Do they have an electoral college? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. So uh, the LG uh, 55 EC 9300, which, by the way, costs 3500 bucks list, which is amazing considering that LG's first 55-inch OLED just over a year ago was 15 grand, um, one in one sense, and the F8500 Plasma, the winner from last year, one in a different sense. What were those two senses? What were the two ways to parse the data? Well, again, we look at the way we always look at it every year, where we slightly weight heavier, just contrast ratio. We always look at how many categories each product wins in. And then we look at the average numbers as well. It was so difficult, again, to claim a winner. Uh, It was very clear. It was very clear that everybody voted very strongly towards the three emissive displays. And and very consistently amongst the LCD panels. So it was easy to know that it was one of those three. And in this case, you might even consider two or three of them as uh, so close. Mm. Yeah. In fact, they are. So very tough uh, voting. We had to be, dig hard and for long at looking at these numbers. Uh, LG won in three out of the uh, six categories. I and thought they won fail- four out of six. I'm sorry. Thank you. They did. They won. I'm just looking over. I'm sorry to have to do that. Mm-hmm. Really. You're yeah, right. No, they no, won that's all right. four out of six categories. And that weighs heavily with us as well. And sure. uh, as far as their loss, if you just counted everything as one point with no weighting, it was one half of one point that the F8500 eked out a, a popular vote win. But even mm. that is ridiculously close. To, mm. to take it by 0.5, a half of a point, <laughs> uh, is, is how much they won by popular vote over the yeah. EC9300. So right. it was a very, right. very, very small win by the popular vote and a very decisive win if you look at the amount of categories, the importance of the categories. Uh, it was very decisive for the EC9300. Uh, mm-hmm. but, the perf- but the performance level in every category wasn't that far away as it was with the LCD panels. What we need to do with LCD, if we're going to continue with LCD, is make UHD more compelling like Joe Kane is teaching us. Yes. Give us uh, more. Mark- Give us a bigger color palette. Give us a little more frame rate, and definitely, uh, above all of that, give us high dynamic range. Yes, yes, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Mark, what were what were your votes? How did how did you end up? Uh, what what was your winner? Well, I, your- I absolutely voted for the F eighty five hundred. I'm I would say that I even allowed it uh, some handicap because I know how well it performs and seeing. But uh, beyond that. Uh, by one single point, if you just add it up, I chose the Samsung OLED over the LG. Mm. Uh, and to look at it, uh, I did it because of how I viewed uh, the way it rendered motion. And if there was one thing I was looking at in all the TVs that that's a priority for me, it's that motion rendering. Uh, it's, I mean... Granted, I, I need the blacks to be really great, but uh, but motion resolution uh, is uh, something that I really enjoy out of my plasma and something that, to my eyes, the LG had to work on, um, how, you know, uh, and that the Samsung had a bit uh, over it. So that that was actually the, the, the decisive category. But I absolutely picked the F8500. Uh, uh, I mean... 
it, it, it was the most color accurate from the most angles uh, yeah. is, is yeah. how I would describe it. And uh, that really appealed to me. Interesting uh, how how different people this you, what you just said just brought, brought up something to me, which is that different people might wait or weigh different oh. categories differently so I somebody might think, talk about that for a second absolutely because yeah well we feedback. only have a we only have a second <laughs> left so go go for it quickly <laughs> i'll go for it quick on on uh, avs forum a lot of people discuss uh, how they watch tv this uh event uh, is biased towards people who will watch the highest possible quality content in a light controlled environment that's uh, that gives a very distinct advantage to those emissive TVs. The uh, LCDs perform a lot better in the kind of environments that are typical uh, that people, you know, that they're watching television, not a Blu-ray. They're watching in their living room. The windows might be open. Those LCDs are often the best choice, you know, for that because also their viewing distance is greater. So uh, there's. To, to, to be negative towards those TVs is to really misunderstand the exact context of the the, the vote that took place there. That's all I want mm -hmm. to say. They're, they're, they're okay. were all pretty amazing TVs. And depending on your needs, uh, the, some of those UHD TVs could, in fact, be the better TV for you. There's no question about that, r r I, irrespective I, I, of these votes. I know we're near the end, but I just wanted to add that uh, unusually so, the F8500 is very, very bright. And the OLEDs are bright. I'm sorry, I was trying to get my glasses on to read it, but I think they put out at peak luminance about a 100-foot lambrance. So yeah. they really they really stand up next to the LCDs in high ambient light. Also, their mm -hmm. black level is not crushed when, you, when the ambient light is turned up. Right, right. And the results, by the way, the results of the uh, shootout – are on AVS Forum, and I'm sure on valueelectronics.com as well, uh, where you can see the uh, results of the voting as well as the um, ANSI contrast measurements and the black level and peak white levels on all, uh, all of the contenders as well. And so I do encourage you to go there and uh, check it out. Well, you know what? We are out of time, and... It's been an absolutely fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, and all I can say is I hope I make it to uh, number 11 next year. <laughs> I hope you do as well. So uh, thank you both very much. Uh, Robert Zone, president of Value Electronics and host of this uh, amazing event, which uh, hopefully will continue into the future. And I certainly look forward to being there. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Scott. I really enjoyed this very much. Good, good. And Mark Henninger, of course, my cohort in crime at avsforum.com. I uh, sure was glad you were there this year and uh, took such great pictures and had so many interesting things to uh, share with us today. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Most informative uh, event of the year, definitely. Got yep. a great deal out of it. Thank you, Robert. And thanks, Scott. Love being on you the bet. show. You bet. Um, so Robert's uh, website, as I mentioned before, is valueelectronics.com. And uh, you can find me and Mark both at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott and also at avsforum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here on twit.tv slash htg. And you can find us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. <clears throat> Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be John Iverson. He is the web monkey for the websites of Stereophile, Sound and Vision, uh, Inner Fidelity, Analog Planet, uh, and several others uh, of great interest to this audience. And he's going to be talking about his very interesting perspective on blind audio testing has to do with the high-resolution audio test that I'm conducting on AVS Forum. And uh, he's got some, uh, uh, might we say, controversial things to say about it. So I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you will join us. Until then, geek out. Geek out.